coming into September were quite fresh. So. And I don't think uh, we've ever seen a top six as even as we've yeah. got right now. And the Giants, they were challenged, they were uh, questioned, but uh, they answered their critics about uh, whether or not they'd deal with the occasion pretty quickly. And uh, I think the plan going in was beat them up in the inside and um, kill them on the outside. Yeah, you know, we all thought about will they handle the pressure, will they be able to match it physically. To me, they were the aggressors. Yeah. They're the ones that took it on. And they made a statement. They weren't going to take a backward step. And they were happy to get in the faces of their opponents. I thought it was super impressive. The level of pressure that they put on was outstanding. And they deserved this victory uh, every step of the way. 91 to 55, the tackling in, mm. in GWS's favour. And they won by 40 points. Yep. So it was sensational. But they, this side was built for finals. I remember three, four years ago when these kids started... They'd be 10, 15 yep. goals down, Jared, and they'd be still sledging you. <laughs> they were getting stuck in you. And people caught a cockiness and arrogance and all that. But when, they, when these lads happen. grew up, you knew that they yeah. were going to be built for September football where it's really combative. And they were going to carry that through. And, and that was a really good example on the weekend, bashing Big Brother up. You tell me, Jared. now with a couple of injuries, who do the Swans bring in? Well, they would have liked to have uh, had Zach Jones available. I'm sure Jeremy Laidler is going to come in. But uh, Zach Jones, uh, who we know <laughs> went down with an ankle injury, uh, had fought his way back. And it seems that uh, the physical approach continued even in the oh, NEFL grand final, oh, with the, uh, which the Giants won handsomely as well. There was no report uh, on that particular incident, was, I've got to say. He was out for a couple he of minutes. He was out too. for uh, between one and two minutes. Yeah. Mm. So uh, his season is uh, just about uh, done and dusted. David, you're going to talk to us about <laughs> the Giants. And I remember uh, talking to Ross Lyon on... Saturday night, uh, he described uh, Nick Hayne as a, an upgraded rookie because he was picked number seven in the draft. <laughs> yeah, let's have a look at their lineup from the weekend and just uh, see why this is a dangerous, dangerous proposition now. I mean, if they win the flag this year, good luck trying to steal it off them for the next five. Yeah. There's the lineup for the weekend. Let's have a look at the picks that they were originally selected at. Now, the traded players, we've actually upgraded them to the swap of the pick. So he's sure in the back pocket there was traded to, for Taylor Adams, who was pick 13. So we've assumed that that's like for like. The uncontracted players was the original pick. So Tom Scully be pick one. In that lineup, they've got 13 top 10s and 18 top 21 picks <laughs> in the competition. One rookie, Zach Williams, is the only rookie in that, that, uh, that team. And Mumford, we've given pick 35, but we know his special circumstance. Rory Lobb's the only other one at pick 29. So it is an amazing lineup. There's no doubt there's a lot of work has to go in for them to achieve the ultimate and win a flag. But, gee, what a fantastic platform it is. And it was the only, uh, I think, responsible move by the game was to give them... They're going to take up the biggest challenge in the country as far as AFL foot is concerned. They had to be given... A pretty talented side. and they have to pull it back, though, Jared, at some yeah, stage. Yeah, What's going to be the pullback, pull though? Now. You can't well, pull it back. You have to look at the, the Riverina um, Academy zone, see whether they can still operate there. Maybe that has to go back into the pool. I don't think but, you're going to keep allowing them to top up like that because they'll be trading players for the next two to three years. That's the thing. They've selections. got such a talent base. They're going to keep getting good draft they've got, picks. They've got too much. Keep we gave them kids, too much but, at the start. But the funny thing is we think of them as the new kids on the block, the youngsters. Swans were younger. On the weekend. They, had they were. They players without experience. Yeah, we spoke about this on Saturday, didn't mm. we? And just uh, reiterating the point, if you have a look at uh, the players on the ground who had played 20 games or less, the Swans had six <laughs> and the Giants had one. But I think, David, it's, uh, I think this is testament to the job that John Longmire has done. There's been a lot of responsibility and a lot of pressure on the Swans because they finished on top of the ladder. But... I don't think we've acknowledged how good a performance it was to finish that high on the ladder, given how inexperienced their underbelly was. Seven debutants have had this year. And you could argue that Callum Mills is probably their biggest out. Yeah. He's been a sensational mm. player for them across half-back and, and very difficult to replace. Buddy, I want to talk to you... Uh, sorry, Brownie, I want to talk to you about Buddy Franklin. I wish is. we would move like Buddy, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but we know he can play well upfield. Mm. Are they getting full value out of him? If you're the opposition and you were GWS on the weekend, would you have loved seeing Buddy up the ground getting most of his possessions? Yeah, because he didn't have a scoreboard impact. It's interesting. Look at his plot. Yeah, that's right. Didn't kick a goal. And uh, look at all those possessions up the field. Still had, you know, these 20 disposals yeah. for the game. But they would only need to look at uh, round 23 against Richmond. And obviously they smashed Richmond, uh, Sydney did. But again, it was on the back end of a lot of slingshot goals. And Buddy was one of the major contributors to that, where he, get, where he gets out the, out the yeah. back of the Richmond defence. And then, so we just have a look at this game. You can see Sydney players just streaming forward. This is their MO and has been the last few years. They get 
all their defenders up the field and then they turn around. Let's have a look at it on the weekend. Now, Phil Davis was Buddy's direct opponent for most of the day. Phil Davis just happy to lay off him there. He's out of goal scoring distance, but then comes up and man's a mark really strong there. Okay? And if he, if he went any further up, he'd actually drop right he, back. Exactly so right. And, and again, helped here by Tomlinson. Tomlinson really taking the back position, holding back, not allowing Buddy Franklin goal side. This is the same clip, same bit of vision. We'll also see Nick Haynes there supporting. Now, in the past, so many times we see Sydney be able to slingshot past yep. there and there's no opposition defenders. They're running into open space. But as a team, now Phil Davis was the direct opponent, but as a general GWS defence, they were really well organised and they said, you are not in, not getting goal side of us, King. That forward 50 of the Swans needs a huge amount of work. Mm. They were out positioned by Shaw, Haynes and Williams all day. Led to uh, spots where they weren't utilised and they zoned off so easy. It was impossible for them to score and I think they need to look at the mechanics of that. They can't allow Buddy to run up the field at the moment while they don't have well, a bonafide well, target. You did bring it up at the start of the year, King, whether they are too reliant on Buddy's the amount he contributes to the goal As long scoring. as it's working. As soon as yeah. that forward 50 fails, he needs to go back. But I want to have a look at an un -Sydney like performance uh, defensively on the weekend. Yeah. And Buddy's the man I want to put under the spotlight, Jared. He was playing up the field, as you said, Brownie. Here he is standing next to Lockie Whitfield. Ball in the midfield. So he's, he knows he's there. He knows he's got a responsibility to the team now to push back with Lockie, to go with him to cover until he's in a, until Sydney either win the ball back or he's not in a dangerous position. Lockie, to his credit, and he had a tough couple of weeks, charges all the way and commits to his run, goes all the way to the goal square, and is rewarded with a goal just through sheer work rate. Franklin's still in the middle of the ground. I don't see Sydney Swans ever doing that. I think that's the last time that we'll see that for some time. They had their worst defensive game on turnover. They coughed up 74 points, which is five goals more than their average. It was just a horrible day for the I sport. think uh, John Longmore will be focusing a lot on their chase. We spoke about Naismith. There was uh, one with Xavier Richards that just did not uh, enter the Sydney Swans playbook at all. John Longmore referred to their tackling count, their tackle count mm. in the post-game press conference. They only had the 54 tackles. Now, sometimes tackles can be overrated, but I think Sydney are a team that like to get their 80, 90 tackles a game. They rely heavily on their tackle count. Looking forward to talking to Sam Mitchell about what was another great uh, final, an epic on Friday night. But uh, let's analyse, if we can, uh, <laughs> David, the last minute and a half. because.